Chapters eight and nine of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen hundred and eighty-seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter eight. When I awoke, I felt greatly refreshed and lay a considerable time in a dozing state, enjoying the sensation of bodily comfort. The experiences of the day previous, my waking to find myself in the year two thousand, the sight of the new Boston, my host and his family and the wonderful things I had heard, were a blank in my memory. I thought I was in my bedchamber at home, and the half-dreaming, half-waking fancies which passed before my mind related to the incidents and experiences of my former life. Dreamily I reviewed the incidents of Decoration Day, my trip in company with Edith and her parents to Mount Auburn, and my dining with them on our return to the city. I recalled how extremely well Edith had looked, and from that fell to thinking of our marriage." but scarcely had my imagination begun to develop this delightful theme than my waking dream was cut short by the recollection of the letter I had received the night before from the builder announcing that the new strikes might postpone indefinitely the completion of the new house. The chagrin which this recollection brought with it effectually roused me. I remembered that I had an appointment with the builder at eleven o'clock to discuss the strike, and, opening my eyes, looked up at the clock at the foot of my bed to see what time it was but no clock met my glance, and what was more, I instantly perceived that I was not in my room. Starting up on my couch, I stared wildly round the strange apartment. I think it must have been many seconds that I sat up thus in bed, staring about, without being able to regain the clue to my personal identity. I was no more able to distinguish myself from pure being during those moments than we may suppose a soul in the rough to be before it has received the earmarks the individualizing touches which make it a person. Strange that the sense of this inability should be such anguish. But so we are constituted. There are no words for the mental torture I endured during this helpless, eyeless groping for myself in a boundless void. No other experience of the mind gives probably anything like the sense of absolute intellectual arrest from the loss of a mental fulcrum, a starting point of thought, which comes during such a momentary obscuration of the sense of one's identity. I trust I may never know what it is again. I do not know how long this condition had lasted. It seemed an interminable time, when, like a flash, the recollection of everything came back to me. I remembered who and where I was, and how I had come here, and that these scenes, as of the life of yesterday, which had been passing before my mind, concerned a generation, long, long ago, moulded to dust. Leaping from bed, I stood in the middle of the room, clasping my temples with all my might between my hands to keep them from bursting. Then I fell prone on the couch, and, burying my face in the pillow, lay without motion. The reaction which was inevitable from the mental elation, the fever of the intellect that had been the first effect of my tremendous experience, had arrived. The emotional crisis which had awaited the full realization of my actual position, and all that it implied, was upon me, and with set teeth and laboring chest, gripping the bedstead with frenzied strength, I lay there and fought for my sanity. In my mind all had broken loose, habits of feeling, associations of thought, ideas of persons and things, all had dissolved and lost coherence, and were seething together in apparently irretrievable chaos. There were no rallying points, nothing was left stable, there only remained the will, and was any human will strong enough to say to such a weltering sea, peace, be still. I dared not think. Every effort to reason upon what had befallen me, and realize what it implied, set up an intolerable swimming of the brain. The idea that I was two persons, that my identity was double, began to fascinate me with its simple solution of my experience. I knew that I was on the verge of losing my mental balance. If I lay there thinking, I was doomed. Diversion of some sort I must have, at least a diversion of physical exertion. I sprang up, and, hastily dressing, opened the door of my room and went downstairs. The hour was very early, it being not yet fairly light, and I found no one in the lower part of the house. There was a hat in the hall, and, opening the front door, which was fastened with a slightness indicating that burglary was not among the perils of the modern Boston, I found myself on the street. For two hours I walked or ran through the streets of the city, visiting most quarters of the peninsular part of the town. None but an antiquarian who knows something of the contrast which the Boston of today offers to the Boston of the nineteenth century can begin to appreciate 
what a series of bewildering surprises I underwent during that time. Viewed from the housetop the day before, the city had indeed appeared strange to me, but that was only in its general aspect. How complete the change had been I first realized now that I walked the streets. The few old landmarks which still remained only intensified this effect, for without them I might have imagined myself in a foreign town. A man may leave his native city in childhood, and return fifty years later, perhaps, to find it transformed in many features. He is astonished, but he is not bewildered. He is aware of a great lapse of time, and of changes likewise occurring in himself meanwhile. He but dimly recalls the city as he knew it when a child. But remember that there was no sense of any lapse of time with me. So far as my consciousness was concerned, it was but yesterday, but a few hours, since I had walked these streets, in which scarcely a feature had escaped a complete metamorphosis. The mental image of the old city was so fresh and strong that it did not yield to the impression of the actual city, but contended with it, so that it was first one and then the other which seemed the more unreal. There was nothing I saw which was not blurred in this way, like the faces of a composite photograph. Finally, I stood again at the door of the house from which I had come out. My feet must have instinctively brought me back to the side of my old home, for I had no clear idea of returning thither. It was no more homelike to me than any other spot in this city of its strange generation, nor were its inmates less utterly and necessarily strangers than all the other men and women now on the earth. Had the door of the house been locked, I should have been reminded by its resistance that I had no object in entering, and turned away. But it yielded to my hand, and advancing with uncertain steps through the hall, I entered one of the apartments opening from it. Throwing myself into a chair, I covered my burning eyeballs with my hands to shut out the horror of strangeness. My mental confusion was so intense as to produce actual nausea. The anguish of those moments during which my brain seemed melting, or the abjectness of my sense of helplessness, how can I describe? In my despair I groaned aloud. I began to feel that unless some help should come, I was about to lose my mind. And just then it did come. I heard the rustle of drapery and looked up. Edith Leet was standing before me. Her beautiful face was full of the most poignant sympathy. "'Oh, what's the matter, Mr. West?' she said. "'I was here when you came in. I saw how dreadfully distressed you looked, and when I heard you groan, I could not keep silent. What has happened to you? Where have you been?' Can't I do something for you? Perhaps she involuntarily held out her hands in a gesture of compassion as she spoke. At any rate, I had caught them in my own, and was clinging to them with an impulse as instinctive as that which prompts the drowning man to seize upon and cling to the rope which is thrown him as he sings for the last time. As I looked up into her compassionate face and her eyes moist with pity, my brain ceased to whirl. The tender human sympathy which thrilled in the soft pressure of her fingers had brought me the support I needed. Its effect to calm and soothe was like that of some wonder-working elixir. "'God bless you,' I said after a few moments. "'He must have sent you to me just now. I think I was in danger of going crazy if you had not come.' At this the tears came into her eyes. "'Oh, Mr. West,' she cried, "'how heartless you must have thought us!' How could we leave you to yourself so long? But it is over now, is it not? You are better, surely. Yes, I said, thanks to you. If you will not go away quite yet, I shall be myself soon. Indeed, I will not go away, she said, with a little quiver of her face, more expressive of her sympathy than a volume of words. You must not think us so heartless as we seemed in leaving you so by yourself. I scarcely slept last night, for thinking how strange your waking would be this morning. But father said you would sleep till late. He said that it would be better not to show too much sympathy with you at first, but to try to divert your thoughts and make you feel that you were among friends. "'You have indeed made me feel that,' I answered. "'But you see, it is a good deal of a jolt to drop a hundred years, and although I did not seem to feel it so much last night, I have had very odd sensations this morning.' While I held her hands and kept my eyes on her face, I could already even jest a little at my plight. "'No one thought of such a thing as you're going out in the city alone so early in the morning,' she went on. "'Oh, Mr. West, where have you been?' Then I told her of my morning's experience, from my first waking till the moment I had looked up to see her before me, just as I have told it here. 
she was overcome by distressful pity during the recital, and, though I had released one of her hands, did not try to take from me the other, seeing, no doubt, how much good it did me to hold it. "'I can think a little what this feeling must have been like,' she said. "'It must have been terrible. And to think you were left alone to struggle with it. Can you ever forgive us?' "'But it is gone now. You have driven it quite away for the present.' I said. "'You will not let it return again?' she queried anxiously. "'I can't quite say that,' I replied. "'It might be too early to say that, considering how strange everything will still be to me.' "'But you will not try to contend with it alone again, at least,' she persisted. "'Promise that you will come to us, and let us sympathize with you, and try to help you. Perhaps we can't do much, but it will surely be better than to try to bear such feelings alone.' "'I will come to you, if you will let me,' I said. "'Oh, yes, yes, I beg you will,' she said eagerly. "'I would do anything to help you that I could.' "'All you need do is to be sorry for me, as you seem to be now,' I replied. "'It is understood, then,' she said, smiling with wet eyes, "'that you are to come and tell me next time, and not run all over Boston among strangers.' This assumption that we were not strangers seemed scarcely strange, so near within these few minutes had my trouble and her sympathetic tears brought us. "'I will promise when you come to me,' she added, with an expression of charming archness, passing, as she continued, into one of enthusiasm, "'to seem as sorry for you as you wish, but you must not for a moment suppose that I am really sorry for you at all, or that I think you will long be sorry for yourself. I know, as well as I know that the world now is heaven compared with what it was in your day.' that the only feeling you will have after a little while will be one of thankfulness to God that your life in that age was so strangely cut off to be returned to you in this. CHAPTER Nine. Dr. and Mrs. Leed were evidently not a little startled to learn, when they presently appeared, that I had been all over the city alone that morning, and it was apparent that they were agreeably surprised to see that I seemed so little agitated after the experience. "'Your stroll could scarcely have failed to be a very interesting one,' said Mrs. Leet, as we sat down to table soon after. "'You must have seen a good many new things.' "'I saw very little that was not new,' I replied. "'But I think what surprised me as much as anything was not to find any stores on Washington Street, or any banks on State. What have you done with the merchants and bankers? Hung them all, perhaps, as the anarchists wanted to do in my day.' "'Not so bad as that.' replied Dr. Leet, we have simply dispensed with them. Their functions are obsolete in the modern world. "'Who sells you things when you want to buy them?' I inquired. "'There is neither selling nor buying nowadays. The distribution of goods is effected in another way. As to the bankers, having no money, we have no use for those gentry.' "'Miss Leet, said I, turning to Edith, "'I am afraid that your father is making sport of me.' I don't blame him, for the temptation my innocence offers must be extraordinary. But really, there are limits to my credulity as to possible alterations in the social system. Father has no idea of jesting, I'm sure, she replied, with a reassuring smile. The conversation took another turn, then, the point of ladies' fashions in the nineteenth century being raised, if I remember rightly, by Mrs. Leet, and it was not till after breakfast, when the doctor had invited me up to the housetop, which appeared to be a favourite resort of his, let it recur to the subject. "'You were surprised,' he said, "'at my saying that we got along without money or trade. But a moment's reflection will show that trade existed and money was needed in your day simply because the business of production was left in private hands, and that consequently they are superfluous now.' "'I do not at once see how that follows,' I replied. "'It is very simple,' said Dr. Leet. When innumerable different and independent persons produce the various things needful to life and comfort, endless exchanges between individuals were a requisite in order that they might supply themselves with what they desired. These exchanges constituted trade, and money was essential as their medium. But as soon as the nation became the sole producer of all sorts of commodities, there was no need of exchanges between individuals that they might get what they required. Everything was procurable from one source and nothing could be procured anywhere else. A system of direct distribution from the national storehouses took the place of trade, and for this money was unnecessary. "'How is this distribution managed?' I asked. "'On the simplest possible plan,' replied Dr. Leet. 
a credit corresponding to his share of the annual product of the nation is given to every citizen on the public books at the beginning of each year, and a credit card issued him with which he procures at the public storehouses, found in every community, whatever he desires, whenever he desires it. This arrangement, you'll see, totally obviates the necessity for business transactions of any sort between individuals and consumers. Perhaps you would like to see what our credit cards are like." You observe, he pursued, as I was curiously examining the piece of pasteboard he gave me, that this card is issued for a certain number of dollars. We have kept the old word, but not the substance. The term, as we use it, answers to no real thing, but merely serves as an algebraical symbol for comparing the values of products with one another. For this purpose they are all prized in dollars and cents, just as in your day. The value of what I procure on this card is checked off by the clerk, who pricks out of these tires of squares the price of what I order. If you wanted to buy something of your neighbour, could you transfer part of your credit to him as consideration? I inquired. In the first place, replied Dr. Leed, our neighbours have nothing to sell us, but in any event our credit would not be transferable, being strictly personal. Before the nation could even think of honouring any such transfer as you speak of, it would be bound to inquire into all the circumstances of the transaction, so as to be able to guarantee its absolute equity. It would have been reason enough, had there been no other, for abolishing money, that its possession was no indication of rightful title to it. In the hands of the man who had stolen it, or murdered for it, it was as good as in those which had earned it by industry. People nowadays interchange gifts and favours out of friendship, but buying and selling is considered absolutely inconsistent with the mutual benevolence and disinterestedness which should prevail between citizens, and the sense of community of interest which supports our social system. According to our ideas, buying and selling is essentially antisocial in all its tendencies. It is an education in self-seeking at the expense of others, and no society whose citizens are trained in such a school can possibly rise above a very low grade of civilization. "'What if you have to spend more than your card in any one year?' I asked. The provision is so ample that we are more likely not to spend it all, replied Dr. Leed. But if extraordinary expenses should exhaust it, we can obtain a limited advance on the next year's credit, though this practice is not encouraged, and a heavy discount is charged to check it. Of course, if a man showed himself a reckless spendthrift, he would receive his allowance monthly or weekly instead of yearly, or if necessary, not be permitted to handle it all. If you don't spend your allowance, I suppose it accumulates. That is also permitted to a certain extent, when a special outlay is anticipated, but unless notice to the contrary is given, it is presumed that the citizen who does not fully expend his credit did not have occasion to do so, and the balance is turned into the general surplus. Such a system does not encourage saving habits on the part of citizens, I said. It is not intended to, was the reply. The nation is rich, and does not wish the people to deprive themselves of any good thing. In your day, men were bound to lay up goods and money against coming failure of the means of support and for their children. This necessity made parsimony a virtue. But now it would have no such laudable object, and, having lost its utility, it has ceased to be regarded as a virtue. No man any more has any care for the morrow, either for himself or his children, for the nation guarantees the nurture, education, and comfortable maintenance of every citizen, from the cradle to the grave." "'That is a sweeping guarantee,' I said. "'What certainty can there be that the value of a man's labour will recompense the nation for its outlay on him? On the whole, society may be able to support all its members, but some must earn less than enough for their support, and others more. And that brings us back once more to the wages question, on which you have hitherto said nothing. It was at just this point, if you remember, that our talk ended last evening. And I say again, as I did then, that here I should suppose a national industrial system like yours would find its main difficulty. How, I ask once more, can you adjust satisfactorily the comparative wages or remuneration of the multitude of avocations, so unlike and so incommensurable, which are necessary for the service of society? In our day the market rate determined the price of labour of all sorts, as well as of goods. The employer paid as little as he could, and the worker got as much." It was not a pretty system, ethically, I admit, but it did at least furnish us a rough and ready formula for settling a question which must be settled ten thousand times a day if the world was ever going to get forward. 
there seemed to us no other practicable way of doing it. Yes, replied Dr. Leed. It was the only practicable way under a system which made the interests of every individual antagonistic to those of every other. But it would have been a pity if humanity could never have devised a better plan, for yours was simply the application to the mutual relations of men of the devil's maxim, your necessity is my opportunity. The reward of any service dependent not upon its difficulty, danger, or hardship, for throughout the world it seems that the most perilous, severe, and repulsive labor was done by the worst paid classes, but solely upon the strait of those who needed the service. All that is conceded, I said, but with all its defects, the plan of settling prices by the market rate was a practical plan, and I cannot conceive what satisfactory substitute you can have devised for it. The government being the only possible employer, there is of course no labor market or market rate. Wages of all sorts must be arbitrarily fixed by the government. I cannot imagine a more complex and delicate function than that must be, or one, however performed, more certain to breed universal dissatisfaction. I beg your pardon, replied Dr. Leed, but I think you exaggerate the difficulty. Suppose a board of fairly sensible men were charged with settling the wages for all sorts of trades, under a system which, like ours, guaranteed employment to all, while permitting the choice of avocations. Don't you see that, however unsatisfactory the first adjustment might be, the mistakes would soon correct themselves? The favoured trades would have too many volunteers, and those discriminated against would lack them till the errors were set right. But this is aside from the purpose, for, though this plan would, I fancy, be practicable enough, it is no part of our system. How, then, do you regulate wages? I once more asked. Dr. Leed did not reply till after several moments of meditative silence. I know, of course, he finally said, enough of the old order of things to understand just what you mean by that question and yet the present order is so utterly different at this point that I am a little at loss how to answer you best. You ask me how we regulate wages. I can only reply that there is no idea in the modern social economy which at all corresponds with what was meant by wages in your day. I suppose you mean that you have no money to pay wages in, said I. But the credit given the worker at the government storehouse answers to his wages with us. How is the amount of the credit given respectively to the workers in different lines determined? By what title does the individual claim his particular share? What is the basis of allotment? His title, replied Dr. Leed, is his humanity. The basis of his claim is the fact that he is a man. The fact that he is a man, I repeated incredulously. Do you possibly mean that all have the same share? Most assuredly. The readers of this book, never having practically known any other arrangement, or perhaps very carefully considered the historical accounts of former epochs in which a very different system prevailed, cannot be expected to appreciate the stupor of amazement into which Dr. Leeds' simple statement plunged me. You see, he said, smiling, that it is not merely that we have no money to pay wages in, but, as I said, we have nothing at all answering to your idea of wages. By this time I had pulled myself together sufficiently to voice some of the criticisms which, man of the nineteenth century as I was, came uppermost in my mind upon this, to me, astounding arrangement. "'Some men do twice the work of others!' I exclaimed. "'Are the clever workmen content with a plan that ranks them with the indifferent?' "'We leave no possible ground for any complaint of injustice,' replied Dr. Leed, "'by requiring precisely the same measure of service from all.' "'How can you do that?' I should like to know, when no two men's powers are the same. Nothing could be simpler, was Dr. Leeds' reply. We require of each that he shall make the same effort, that is, we demand of him the best service it is in his power to give. And suppose it all do the best they can, I answered. The amount of the product resulting is twice greater from one man than from another. Very true, replied Dr. Leed. But the amount of the resulting product has nothing whatever to do with the question which is one of dessert. Dessert is a moral question, and the amount of the product a material quantity. It would be an extraordinary sort of logic which should try to determine a moral question by a material standard. The amount of the effort alone is pertinent to the question of dessert. All men who do their best do the same. 
A man's endowments, however godlike, merely fix the measure of his duty. The man of great endowments, who does not do all he might, though he may do more than a man of small endowments who does his best, is deemed a less deserving worker than the latter, and dies a debtor to his fellows. The Creator sets men's tasks for them by the faculties he gives them. We simply exact their fulfilment. No doubt that is very fine philosophy, I said. Nevertheless, it seems hard that the man who produces twice as much as another, even if both do their best, should have only the same share. Does it indeed seem so to you? responded Dr. Leed. Now, do you know, that seems very curious to me. The way it strikes people nowadays is that a man who can produce twice as much as another with the same effort, instead of being rewarded for doing so, ought to be punished if he does not do so. In the nineteenth century, when a horse pulled a heavier load than a goat, I suppose you rewarded him. Now we should have whipped him soundly if he had not, on the ground that, being much stronger, he ought to. It is singular how ethical standards change. The doctor said this with such a twinkle in his eye that I was obliged to laugh. I suppose, I said, that the real reason that we rewarded men for their endowments, while we considered those of horses and goats merely as fixing the service to be severally required of them, was that the animals, not being reasoning beings, naturally did the best they could, whereas men could only be induced to do so by rewarding them according to the amount of their product. That brings me to ask why, unless human nature has mightily changed in a hundred years, you are not under the same necessity. We are, replied Dr. Leed. I don't think there has been any change in human nature in that respect since your day. It is still so constituted that special incentives in the form of prizes and advantages to be gained are requisite to call out the best endeavours of the average man in any direction. But what inducement, I asked, can a man have to put forth his best endeavours when, however much or little he accomplishes, his income remains the same? High characters may be moved by devotion to the common welfare under such a system, but does not the average man tend to rest back on his oar, reasoning that it is of no use to make a special effort, since the effort will not increase his income? nor its withholding diminish it. "'Does it then really seem to you,' answered my companion, "'that human nature is insensible to any motives save fear of want and love of luxury, that you should expect security and equality of livelihood to leave them without possible incentives to effort? Your contemporaries did not really think so, though they might fancy they did. When it was a question of the grandest class of efforts, the most absolute self-devotion, they depended on quite other incentives.' not higher wages, but honour and the hope of man's gratitude, patriotism, and the inspiration of duty, were the motives which they set before their soldiers when it was a question of dying for the nation, and never was there an age of the world when those motives did not call out what is best and noblest in man. And not only this, but when you come to analyse the love of money, which was the general impulse to effort in your day, you find that the dread of want and desire of luxury was but one of several motives which the pursuit of money represented, the others, and with many the more influential, being desire of power, of social position, and reputation for ability and success. So you see that though we have abolished poverty and the fear of it, and inordinate luxury with the hope of it, we have not touched the greater part of the motives which underlay the love of money in former times, or any of those which prompted the supremer sorts of effort. The coarser motives, which no longer move us, have been replaced by higher motives, wholly unknown to the mere wage-earners of your age. Now that industry of whatever sort is no longer self-service, but service of the nation, patriotism, passion for humanity, impel the worker, as in your day they did the soldier. The army of industry is an army, not alone by virtue of its perfect organization, but by reason also of the ardor of self-devotion which animates its members. But, as you used to supplement the motives of patriotism with the love of glory in order to stimulate the valour of your soldiers, so do we. Based as our industrial system is on the principle of requiring the same unit of effort from every man, that is, the best he can do, you will see that the means by which we spur the workers to do their best must be a very essential part of our scheme. With us, diligence in the national service is the sole and certain way to public repute, social distinction, and official power. The value of a man's services to society fixes his rank in it. Compared with the effect of our social arrangements in impelling men to be zealous in business, 
we deem the object lessons of biting poverty and wanton luxury on which you depended, a device as weak and uncertain as it was barbaric. The lust of honour, even in your sordid day, notoriously impelled men to more desperate effort than the love of money could. "'I should be extremely interested,' I said, "'to learn something of what these social arrangements are.' "'The scheme in its details,' replied the doctor, "'is of course very elaborate, for it underlies the entire organization of our industrial army. But a few words will give you a general idea of it.' At this moment our talk was charmingly interrupted by the emergence upon the aerial platform where we sat of Edith Leet. She was dressed for the street, and had come to speak to her father about some commission she was to do for him. "'By the way, Edith,' he exclaimed, as she was about to leave us to ourselves, "'I wonder if Mr. West would not be interested in visiting the store with you. I have been telling him something about our system of distribution, and perhaps he might like to see it in practical operation.' "'My daughter,' he added, turning to me, is an indefatigable shopper, and can tell you more about the stores than I can. The proposition was naturally very agreeable to me, and Edith, being good enough to say that she should be glad to have my company, we left the house together. End of chapter 9《And eleven of Looking Backward》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking backward, 2000 to 1887, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter 10. If I'm going to explain our way of shopping to you, said my companion as we walked along the street, you must explain your way to me. I have never been able to understand it from all I have read on the subject. For example, when you had such a vast number of shops, each with its different assortment, how could a lady ever settle upon any purchase till she had visited all the shops? For, until she had, she could not know what there was to choose from. It was, as you suppose, that was the only way she could know, I replied. Father calls me an indefatigable shopper, but I should soon be a very fatigued one if I had to do as they did, was Edith's laughing comment. The loss of time in going from shop to shop was indeed a waste which the busy bitterly complained of. I said, but as for the ladies of the idle class, though they complained also, I think the system was really a godsend by furnishing a device to kill time. But say there were a thousand shops in a city, hundreds, perhaps, of the same sort, how could even the idlest find time to make their rounds? They really could not visit all, of course, I replied. Those who did a great deal of buying learned in time where they might expect to find what they wanted. This class had made a science of the specialties of the shops, and bought at advantage, always getting the most and best for the least money. It required, however, long experience to acquire this knowledge. Those who were too busy, or bought too little to gain it, took their chances, and were generally unfortunate, getting the least and worst for the most money. It was the merest chance if persons not experienced in shopping received the value of their money. "'But why did you put up with such a shockingly inconvenient arrangement when you saw its faults so plainly?' Edith asked me. "'It was like all our social arrangements,' I replied. "'You can see their faults scarcely more plainly than we did, but we saw no remedy for them.' "'Here we are at the store of our ward,' said Edith, as we turned in at the great portal of one of the magnificent public buildings I had observed in my morning walk. There was nothing in the exterior aspect of the edifice to suggest a store to a representative of the nineteenth century. There was no display of goods in the great windows, or any device to advertise wares or attract custom. Nor was there any sort of sign or legend on the front of the building to indicate the character of the business carried on there. But instead, above the portal, standing out from the front of the building, a majestic life-size group of statuary, the central figure of which was a female ideal of plenty with her cornucopia. Judging from the composition of the throng passing in and out, about the same proportion of the sexes among shoppers obtained as in the nineteenth century. As we entered, Edith said that there was one of these great distributing establishments in each ward of the city, so that no residence was more than five or ten minutes' walk from one of them. It was the first interior of a twentieth-century public building that I had ever beheld, and the spectacle naturally impressed me deeply. I was in a vast hall full of light, 
received not only from the windows on all sides, but from the dome, the point of which was a hundred feet above. Beneath it, in the centre of the hall, a magnificent fountain played, cooling the atmosphere to a delicious freshness with its spray. The walls and ceiling were frescoed in mellow tints, calculated to soften without absorbing the light which flooded the interior. Around the fountain was a space occupied with chairs and sofas, on which many persons were seated conversing. Legends on the walls all about the hall indicated to what classes of commodities the countess below were devoted. Edith directed her steps towards one of these, where samples of muslin of a bewildering variety were displayed, and proceeded to inspect them. "'Where is the clerk?' I asked, for there was no one behind the counter, and no one seemed coming to attend to the customer. "'I have no need of the clerk yet,' said Edith. "'I have not made my selection.' "'It was the principal business of clerks to help people to make their selections in my day,' I replied. "'What? To tell people what they wanted?' "'Yes, and oftener to induce them to buy what they didn't want.' "'But did not ladies find that very impertinent?' Edith asked, wonderingly. "'What concern could it possibly be to the clerks whether people bought or not?' "'It was their sole concern,' I answered. "'They were hired for the purpose of getting rid of the goods.' and were expected to do their utmost, short of the use of force, to compass that end. "'Ah, yes, how stupid I am to forget,' said Edith. "'The storekeeper and his clerks depended for their livelihood on selling the goods in your day. Of course, that is all different now. The goods are the nation's. They are here for those who want them, and it is the business of the clerks to wait on people and take their orders. But it is not the interest of the clerk or the nation to dispose of a yard or a pound of anything.' to anybody who does not want it. She smiled as she added, How exceedingly odd it must have seemed to have clerks trying to induce one to take what one did not want or was doubtful about. But even a twentieth-century clerk might make himself useful in giving you information about the goods, though he did not tease you to buy them, I suggested. No, said Edith, that is not the business of the clerk. These printed cards, for which the government authorities are responsible, give us all the information we can possibly need. I saw then that there was fastened to each sample a card containing in succinct form a complete statement of the make and materials of the goods and all its qualities, as well as price, leaving absolutely no point to hang a question on. The clerk has, then, nothing to say about the goods he sells, I said. Nothing at all. It is not necessary that he should know or profess to know anything about them. Courtesy and accuracy in taking orders are all that are required of him. What a prodigious amount of lying that simple arrangement saves, I ejaculated. Do you mean that all the clerks misrepresented their goods in your day? Edith asked. God forbid that I should say so, I replied, for there were many who did not, and they were entitled to a special credit, for when one's livelihood and that of his wife and babies depended on the amount of goods he could dispose of, the temptation to deceive the customer, or let him deceive himself, was well-nigh overwhelming. But, Miss Leed, I am distracting you from your task with my talk. Not at all. I have made my selections. With that she touched a button, and in a moment a clerk appeared. He took down her order on a tablet with a pencil which made two copies, of which he gave one to her, and enclosing the counterpart in a small receptacle, dropped it into a transmitting tube. "'The duplicate of the order,' said Edith, as she turned away from the counter, after the clerk had punched the value of her purchase out of the credit card she gave him, "'is given to the purchaser, so that any mistakes in filling it can be easily traced and rectified.' "'You were very quick about your selections,' I said. "'May I ask how you knew that you might not have found something to suit you better in some of the other stores?' but probably you are required to buy in your own district. Oh, no, she replied, we buy where we please, though naturally most often near home. But I should have gained nothing by visiting other stores. The assortment in all is exactly the same, representing as it does, in each case, samples of all the varieties produced or imported by the United States. That is why one can decide quickly, and never need visit two stores. And is this merely a sample store? I see no clerks cutting off goods or marking bundles. All our stores are sample stores, except as to a few classes of articles. The goods, with these exceptions, are all at the great central warehouse of the city, to which they are shipped directly from the producers. 
we order from the sample and the printed statement of texture, make, and qualities. The orders are sent to the warehouse and the goods distributed from there. That must be a tremendous saving of handling, I said. By our system, the manufacturer sold to the wholesaler, the wholesaler to the retailer, and the retailer to the consumer, and the goods had to be handled each time. You avoid one handling of the goods and eliminate the retailer altogether, with his big profit and the army of clerks it goes to support. Why, Miss Leed, this store is merely the order department of a wholesale house, with no more than a wholesaler's complement of clerks. Under our system of handling the goods, persuading the customer to buy them, cutting them off and packing them, ten clerks would not do what one does here. The saving must be enormous. I suppose so, said Edith. But of course we have never known any other way. But, Mr. West, you must not fail to ask father to take you to the central warehouse some day, where they receive the orders from the different sample houses all over the city, and parcel out and send the goods to their destinations. He took me there not long ago, and it was a wonderful sight. The system is certainly perfect. For example, over yonder in that sort of cage is the dispatching clerk. The orders, as they are taken by the different departments in the store, are sent by transmitters to him. His assistants sort them and enclose each class in a carrier box by itself. The dispatching clerk has a dozen pneumatic transmitters before him answering to the general classes of goods, each communicating with a corresponding department at the warehouse. He drops the box of orders into the tube it calls for, and a few moments later it drops on the proper desk in the warehouse, together with all the orders of the same sort from the other sample stores. The orders are read off, recorded, and sent to be filled like lightning. The filling I thought the most interesting part. Bales of cloth are placed on spindles and turned by machinery, and the cutter, who also has a machine, works right through one bale after another till exhausted, when another man takes his place and it is the same with those who fill the orders in any other staple. The packages are then delivered by larger tubes to the city districts, and thence distributed to the houses. You may understand how quickly it is all done when I tell you that my order will probably be at home sooner than I could have carried it from here. "'How do you manage in the thinly settled rural districts?' I asked. "'The system is the same,' Edith explained. The village sample shops are connected by transmitters with the central county warehouse, which may be twenty miles away. The transmission is so swift, though, that the time lost on the way is trifling. But to save expense, in many counties one set of tubes connects several villages with the warehouse, and then there is time lost waiting for one another. Sometimes it is two or three hours before goods ordered are received. It was so where I was staying last summer, and I found it quite inconvenient. Footnote. I am informed, since the above is in type, that this lack of perfection in the distributing service of some of the country districts is to be remedied, and that soon every village will have its own set of tubes. End footnote. There must be many other respects also, no doubt, in which the country stores are inferior to the city stores, I suggested. No, Edith answered. They are otherwise precisely as good. The sample shop of the smallest village just like this one, gives you your choice of all the varieties of goods the nation has, for the county warehouse draws on the same source as the city warehouse. As we walked home, I commented on the great variety in the size and cost of the houses. How is it, I asked, that this difference is consistent with the fact that all citizens have the same income? Because, Edith explained, although the income is the same, personal taste determines how the individual shall spend it. Some like fine horses, others, like myself, prefer pretty clothes, and still others want an elaborate table. The rents which the nation receives for these houses vary according to size, elegance, and location, so that everybody can find something to suit. The larger houses are usually occupied by large families, in which there are several to contribute to the rent, while small families like ours find smaller houses more convenient and economical. It is a matter of taste and convenience wholly. I have read that in old times people often kept up establishments and did other things which they could not afford for ostentation, to make people think them richer than they were. Was it really so, Mr. West? I shall have to admit that it was, I replied. Well, you see, it could not be so nowadays, for everybody's income is known, and it is known that what is spent one way must be saved another. Chapter 11 
When we arrived home, Dr. Leith had not yet returned, and Mrs. Leith was not visible. "'Are you fond of music, Mr. West?' Edith asked. I assured her that it was half of life, according to my notion. "'I ought to apologize for inquiring,' she said. "'It is not a question that we ask one another nowadays, but I have read that in your day, even among the cultured class, there were some who did not care for music.' "'You must remember, in excuse,' I said, "'that we had some rather absurd kinds of music.' "'Yes,' she said, "'I know that. I am afraid I should not have fancied it all myself. Would you like to hear some of ours now, Mr. West?' "'Nothing would delight me so much as to listen to you,' I said. "'To me?' she exclaimed, laughing. "'Did you think I was going to play or sing to you?' "'I hoped so, certainly,' I replied.' Seeing that I was a little abashed, she subdued her merriment and explained. Of course, we all sing nowadays, as a matter of course, in the training of the voice, and some learn to play instruments for their private amusement, but the professional music is so much grander and more perfect than any performance of ours, and so easily commanded when we wish to hear it, that we don't think of calling our singing or playing music at all. All the really fine singers and players are in the musical service, and the rest of us hold our peace for the main part. But would you really like to hear some music? I assured her once more that I would. Come then into the music room, she said, and I followed her into an apartment, finished, without hangings, in wood, with a floor of polished wood. I was prepared for new devices in musical instruments, but I saw nothing in the room which by any stretch of imagination could be conceived as such. It was evident that my puzzled appearance was affording intense amusement to Edith. "'Please look at today's music,' she said, handing me a card, "'and tell me what you would prefer. It is now five o'clock, you will remember.' The card bore the date, September 12, 2000, and contained the longest programme of music I had ever seen. It was as various as it was long, including a most extraordinary range of vocal and instrumental solos, duets, quartets, and various orchestral combinations, I remained bewildered by the prodigious list until Edith's pink fingertip indicated a particular section of it, where several selections were bracketed with the words 5 p.m. against them. Then I observed that this prodigious program was an all-day one, divided into twenty-four sections answering to the hours. There were but a few pieces of music in the 5 p.m. section, and I indicated an organ piece as my preference. "'I'm so glad you like the organ,' said she. "'I think there is scarcely any music that suits my mood oftener.' She made me sit down comfortably, and, crossing the room, so far as I could see, merely touched one or two screws, and at once the room was filled with the music of a grand organ anthem. Filled, not flooded, for, by some means, the volume of melody had been perfectly graduated to the sides of the apartment. I listened, scarcely breathing, to the close.' Such music, so perfectly rendered, I had never expected to hear. Grand! I cried, as the last great wave of sound broke and ebbed away into silence. Bach must be at the keys of that organ. But where is the organ? Wait a moment, please, said Edith. I want to have you listen to this waltz before you ask any questions. I think it is perfectly charming. And as she spoke, the sound of violins filled the room with the witchery of a summer night. When this had also ceased, she said, "'There is nothing in the least mysterious about the music, as you seem to imagine. It is not made by fairies or genii, but by good, honest, and exceedingly clever human hands. We have simply carried the idea of labour-saving, by cooperation, into our musical service as into everything else. There are a number of music-rooms in the city, perfectly adapted, acoustically, to the different sorts of music.' These halls are connected by telephone with all the houses of the city whose people care to pay the small fee, and there are none, you may be sure, who do not. The corps of musicians attached to each hall is so large that, although no individual performer or group of performers has more than a brief part, each day's program lasts through the twenty-four hours. There are on that card for today, as you will see if you observe closely, distinct programs of four of these concerts, each of a different order of music from the others, being now simultaneously performed, and any one of the four pieces now going on that you prefer, you can hear by merely pressing the button which will connect your house-wire with the hall where it is being rendered. 
The programs are so coordinated that the pieces at any one time simultaneously proceeding in the different halls usually offer a choice, not only between instrumental and vocal, and between different sorts of instruments, but also between different motives from grave to gay, so that all tastes and moods can be suited. "'It appears to me, Miss Leet,' I said, "'that if we could have devised an arrangement for providing everybody with music in their homes, perfect in quality, unlimited in quantity, suited to every mood, and beginning and ceasing at will, we should have considered the limit of human felicity already attained, and ceased to strive for further improvements.' I am sure I never could imagine how those among you who depended at all on music managed to endure the old-fashioned system for providing it, replied Edith. Music really worth hearing must have been, I suppose, wholly out of the reach of the masses, and attainable by the most favoured only occasionally, at great trouble, prodigious expense, and then for brief periods, arbitrarily fixed by somebody else, and in connection with all sorts of undesirable circumstances. Your concerts, for instance, and operas. How perfectly exasperating it must have been, for the sake of a piece or two of music that suited you, to have to sit for hours listening to what you did not care for. Now, at a dinner one can skip the courses one does not care for. Who would ever dine, however hungry, if required to eat everything brought on the table? And I'm sure one's hearing is quite as sensitive as one's taste." I suppose it was these difficulties in the way of commanding really good music which made you endure so much playing and singing in your homes by people who had only the rudiments of the art. Yes, I replied, it was that sort of music, or none, for most of us. Ah, well, Edith sighed, when one really considers it is not so strange that people in those days so often did not care for music. I dare say I should have detested it too. "'Did I understand you rightly?' I inquired, "'that this musical program covers the entire twenty-four hours. "'It seems to on this card, certainly. "'But who is there to listen to music between, say, midnight and morning?' "'Oh, many,' Edith replied. "'Our people keep all hours, "'but if the music were provided from midnight to morning for no others, "'it still would be for the sleepless, the sick, and the dying.' All our bedchambers have a telephone attachment at the head of the bed by which any person who may be sleepless can command music at pleasure, of the sort suited to the mood. Is there such an arrangement in the room assigned to me? Why, certainly! And how stupid, how very stupid of me, not to think to tell you of that last night! Father will show you about the adjustment before you go to bed tonight, however— and with the receiver at your ear, I am quite sure you will be able to snap your fingers at all sorts of uncanny feelings if they trouble you again. That evening, Dr. Leed asked us about our visit to the store, and in the course of the desultory comparison of the ways of the nineteenth century and the twentieth, which followed, something raised the question of inheritance. I suppose, I said, the inheritance of property is not now allowed. On the contrary, replied Dr. Leed, there is no interference with it. In fact, you will find, Mr. West, as you come to know us, that there is far less interference of any sort with personal liberty nowadays than you were accustomed to. We require, indeed, by law, that every man shall serve the nation for a fixed period, instead of leaving him his choice, as you did, between working, stealing, or starving. With the exception of this fundamental law, which is, indeed, merely a codification of the law of nature, the Edict of Eden, by which it is made equal in its pressure on men. Our system depends in no particular upon legislation, but is entirely voluntary, the logical outcome of the operation of human nature under rational conditions. This question of inheritance illustrates just that point. The fact that the nation is the sole capitalist and landowner, of course, restricts the individual's possessions to his annual credit, and what personal and household belongings he may have procured with it. His credit, like an annuity in your day, seizes on his death, with the allowance of a fixed sum for funeral expenses. His other possessions he leaves as he pleases. What is to prevent, in course of time, such accumulations of valuable goods and chattels in the hands of individuals as might seriously interfere with equality in the circumstances of citizens? I asked. That matter arranges itself very simply, was the reply. Under the present organization of society, Accumulations of personal property are merely burdensome the moment they exceed what adds to the real comfort. In your day, if a man had a house crammed full with 
gold and silver plate, rare china, expensive furniture, and such things, he was considered rich, for these things represented money, and could at any time be turned into it. Nowadays, a man whom the legacies of a hundred relatives simultaneously dying should place in a similar position would be considered very unlucky. The articles, not being saleable, would be of no value to him, except for their actual use or the enjoyment of their beauty. On the other hand, his income remaining the same, he would have to deplete his credit to hire houses to store the goods in, and still further to pay for the service of those who took care of them. You may be very sure that such a man would lose no time in scattering among his friends possessions which only made him the poorer, and that none of those friends would accept more of them than they could easily spare room for and time to attend to. You see, then, that to prohibit the inheritance of personal property with a view to prevent great accumulations would be a superfluous precaution for the nation. The individual citizen can be trusted to see that he is not overburdened. So careful is he in this respect that the relatives usually waive claim to most of the effects of deceased friends, reserving only particular objects. The nation takes charge of the resigned chattels, and turns such as are of value into the common stock once more. "'You spoke of paying for service to take care of your houses,' said I. "'That suggests a question I have several times been on the point of asking. "'How have you disposed of the problem of domestic service? "'Who are willing to be domestic servants in a community where all are social equals? "'Our ladies found it hard enough to find such even when there was little pretense of social equality. "'It is precisely because we are all social equals whose equality nothing can compromise.' and because service is honourable, in a society whose fundamental principle is that all in turn shall serve the rest, that we could easily provide a corps of domestic servants such as you never dreamt of, if we needed them, replied Dr. Leed. But we do not need them. Who does your housework, then? I asked. There is none to do, said Mrs. Leed, to whom I had addressed this question. Our washing is all done at public laundries at excessively cheap rates, and our cooking at public kitchens. The making and repairing of all we wear are done outside, in public shops. Electricity, of course, takes the place of all fires and lighting. We choose houses no larger than we need, and furnish them so as to involve the minimum of trouble to keep them in order. We have no use for domestic servants. The fact, said Dr. Leed, that you had in the poorer classes a boundless supply of serfs on whom you could impose all sorts of painful and disagreeable tasks made you indifferent to devices to avoid the necessity for them. But now that we all have to do in turn whatever work is done for society, every individual in the nation has the same interest, and a personal one, in devices for lightening the burden. This fact has given a prodigious impulse to labour-saving inventions in all sorts of industry, of which the combination of the maximum of comfort and minimum of trouble in household arrangements was one of the earliest results. In case of special emergencies in the household, pursued Dr. Leed, such as extensive cleaning or renovation, or sickness in the family, we can always secure assistance from the industrial force. But how do you recompense these assistants, since you have no money? We do not pay them, of course, but the nation for them. Their services can be obtained by application at the proper bureau, and their value is pricked off the credit card of the applicant. "'What a paradise for womankind the world must be now!' I exclaimed. "'In my day, even wealth and unlimited servants did not enfranchise their possessors from household cares, while the women of the merely well-to-do and poorer classes lived and died martyrs to them.' "'Yes,' said Miss Leed, "'I've read something of that.' enough to convince me that, badly off as the men, too, were in your day, they were more fortunate than their mothers and wives. The broad shoulders of the nation, said Dr. Leed, bear now like a feather the burden that broke the backs of the women of your day. Their misery came, with all your other miseries, from that incapacity for cooperation which followed from the individualism on which your social system was founded from your inability to perceive that you could make ten times more profit out of your fellow men by uniting with them than by contending with them. The wonder is, not that you did not live comfortably, but that you were able to live together at all, who were all confessedly bent on making one another your servants, and securing possession of one another's goods. There, there, father, if you are so vehement, Mr. West will think you are scolding him, laughingly interposed Edith. 
"'When you want a doctor,' I asked, "'do you simply apply to the proper bureau "'and take any one that may be sent?' "'That rule would not work well in the case of physicians,' replied Dr. Leed. "'The good a physician can do a patient "'depends largely on his acquaintance "'with his constitutional tendencies and conditions. "'The patient must be able, therefore, "'to call in a particular doctor, "'and he does so just as patients did in your day. "'The only difference is that, "'instead of collecting his fee for himself, "'the doctor collects it for the nation "'by pricking off the amount, "'according to a regular scale for medical attendance, "'from the patient's credit card.' "'I can imagine,' I said, "'that if the fee is always the same, and a doctor may not turn away patients, as I suppose he may not, the good doctors are called constantly, and the poor doctors left in idleness. In the first place, if you will overlook the apparent conceit of the remark from a retired physician, replied Dr. Leed with a smile, we have no poor doctors. Anybody who pleases to get a little smattering of medical terms is not now at liberty to practice on the bodies of citizens, as in your day. None but students who have passed the severe tests of the schools and clearly proved their vocation are permitted to practice. Then, too, you will observe that there is nowadays no attempt of doctors to build up their practice at the expense of other doctors. There would be no motive for that. For the rest, the doctor has to render regular reports of his work to the medical bureau, and, if he is not reasonably well employed, work is found for him. End of chapter 11「Looking Backward」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. « Looking Backward » 2000 to 1887 by Edward Bellamy Chapter 12 The questions which I needed to ask before I could acquire even an outline acquaintance with the institutions of the twentieth century being endless, and Dr. Leed's good nature appearing equally so, we sat up talking for several hours after the ladies left us. Reminding my host of the point at which our talk had broken off that morning, I expressed my curiosity to learn how the organization of the industrial army was made to afford a sufficient stimulus to diligence in the lack of any anxiety on the worker's part as to his livelihood. "'You must understand in the first place,' replied the doctor, "'that the supply of incentives to effort is but one of the objects sought in the organization we have adopted for the army. The other, and equally important, is to secure for the file leaders and captains of the force and the great officers of the nation men of proven abilities who are pledged by their own careers to hold their followers up to their highest standard of performance and permit no lagging with a view to these two ends the industrial army is organized first comes the unclassified grade of common laborers men of all work to which all recruits during their first three years belong this grade is a sort of school and a very strict one in which the young men are taught habits of obedience, subordination, and devotion to duty. While the miscellaneous nature of the work done by this force prevents the systematic grading of the workers, which is afterwards possible, yet individual records are kept, and excellence receives distinction, corresponding with the penalties that negligence incurs. It is not, however, policy with us to permit youthful recklessness or indiscretion, when not deeply culpable, to handicap the future careers of young men, and all who have passed through the unclassified grade without serious disgrace have an equal opportunity to choose the life employment they have most liking for. Having selected this, they enter upon it as apprentices. The length of the apprenticeship naturally differs in different occupations. At the end of it, the apprentice becomes a full workman, and a member of his trade or guild, now, not only are the individual records of the apprentices for ability and industry strictly kept, and excellence distinguished by suitable distinctions, but upon the average of his record during apprenticeship, the standing given the apprentice among the full workmen depends. While the internal organizations of different industries, mechanical and agricultural, differ according to their peculiar conditions, they agree in a general division of their workers into first, second, and third grades, according to ability, and these grades are in many cases subdivided into first and second classes. According to his standing as an apprentice, a young man is assigned his place as a first, second, or third grade worker. Of course, only men of unusual ability pass directly from apprenticeship into the first grade of the workers. 
The most fall into the lower grades, working up as they grow more experienced, at the periodical regradings. These regradings take place in each industry at intervals corresponding with the length of the apprenticeship to that industry, so that merit never need wait long to rise, nor can any rest on past achievements unless they would drop into a lower rank. One of the notable advantages of a high grading is the privilege it gives the worker in electing which of the various branches or processes of his industry he will follow as a specialty. Of course, it is not intended that any of these processes shall be disproportionately arduous, but there is often much difference between them, and the privilege of election is accordingly highly prized. So far as possible, indeed, the preferences even of the poorest workmen are considered in assigning them their line of work, because not only their happiness, but their usefulness is thus enhanced. While, however, the wish of the lower-grade man is consulted, so far as the exigencies of the service permit, he is considered only after the upper-grade men have been provided for, and often he has to put up with second or third choice, or even with an arbitrary assignment when help is needed. This privilege of election attends every regrading, and when a man loses his grade, he also risks having to exchange the sort of work he likes for some other less to his taste. The results of each regrading, giving the standing of every man in his industry, are gazetted in the public prints, and those who have won promotion since the last regrading receive the nation's thanks and are publicly invested with a badge of their new rank. "'What may this badge be?' I asked. "'Every industry has its emblematic device,' replied Dr. Leet, "'and this, in the shape of a metallic badge so small that you might not see it unless you knew where to look, is all the insignia which the men of the army wear, except where public convenience demands a distinctive uniform.' This batch is the same in form for all grades of industry, but while the batch of the third grade is iron, that of the second grade is silver, and that of the first is gilt. Apart from the grand incentive to endeavour, afforded by the fact that the high places in the nation are open only to the highest class men, and that rank in the army constitutes the only mode of social distinction for the vast majority who are not aspirants in art, literature, and the professions, Various incitements of a minor but perhaps equally effective sort are provided in the form of special privileges and immunities in the way of discipline, which the superior class men enjoy. These, while intended to be as little as possible invidious to the less successful, have the effect of keeping constantly before every man's mind the great desirability of attaining the grade next above his own. It is obviously important that not only the good, but also the indifferent and poor workmen should be able to cherish the ambition of rising. Indeed, the number of the latter being so much greater, it is even more essential that the ranking system should not operate to discourage them than that it should stimulate the others. It is to this end that the grades are divided into classes. The grades, as well as the classes being made numerically equal at each regrading, there is not at any time counting out the officers and the unclassified and apprentice grades, over one-ninth of the industrial army in the lowest class, and most of this number are recent apprentices, all of whom expect to rise. Those who remain during the entire term of service in the lowest class are but a trifling fraction of the industrial army, and likely to be as deficient in sensibility to their position as in ability to better it. It is not even necessary that a worker should win promotion to a higher grade to have at least a taste of glory. While promotion requires a general excellence of record as a worker, honourable mention and various sorts of prizes are awarded for excellence less than sufficient for promotion, and also for special feats and single performances in the various industries. There are many minor distinctions of standing, not only within the grades, but within the classes, each of which acts as a spur to the efforts of a group. It is intended that no form of merit shall wholly fail of recognition. As for actual neglect of work, positively bad work, or other overt remissness on the part of men incapable of generous motives, the discipline of the industrial army is far too strict to allow anything whatever of the sort. A man able to do duty, and persistently refusing, is sentenced to solitary imprisonment on bread and water till he consents. The lowest grade of the officers of the industrial army, that of assistant foremen or lieutenants, is appointed out of men who have held their place for two years in the first class of the first grade. Where this leaves too large a range of choice, 
only the first group of this class are eligible. No one thus comes to the point of commanding men until he is about thirty years old. After a man becomes an officer, his rating of course no longer depends on the efficiency of his own work, but on that of his men. The foremen are appointed from among the assistant foremen, by the same exercise of discretion limited to a small eligible class. In the appointments to the still higher grades, another principle is introduced, which it would take too much time to explain now. Of course, such a system of grading as I have described would have been impracticable applied to the small industrial concerns of your day, in some of which there were hardly enough employees to have left one apiece for the classes. You must remember that, under the national organization of labor, all industries are carried on by great bodies of men, many of your farms or shops being combined as one. It is also owing solely to the vast scale in which each industry is organized, with coordinate establishments in every part of the country, that we are able by exchanges and transfers to fit every man so nearly with the sort of work he can do best. And now, Mr. West, I will leave it to you, on the bare outline of its features which I have given, if those who need special incentives to do their best are likely to lack them under our system. Does it not seem to you that men who found themselves obliged, whether they wished or not, to work, would under such a system be strongly impelled to do their best? I replied that it seemed to me the incentives offered were, if any objection were to be made, too strong, that the pace set for the young man was too hot, and such, indeed, I would add with deference, still remains my opinion, now that by longer residence among you I have become better acquainted with the whole subject. Dr. Leed, however, desired me to reflect, and am ready to say that it is perhaps a sufficient reply to my objection, that the worker's livelihood is in no way dependent on his ranking, and anxiety for that never embitters his disappointments, that the working hours are short, the vacations regular, and that all emulation ceases at forty-five, with the attainment of middle life. There are two or three other points I ought to refer to, he added, to prevent your getting mistaken impressions. In the first place, you must understand that this system of preferment, given the more efficient workers over the less so, in no way contravenes the fundamental idea of our social system that all who do their best are equally deserving, whether their best be great or small. I have shown that the system is arranged to encourage the weaker as well as the stronger with the hope of rising, while the fact that the stronger are selected for the leaders is in no way a reflection upon the weaker, but in the interest of the common weal. Do not imagine, either, because emulation is given free play as an incentive under our system, that we deem it a motive likely to appeal to the nobler sort of men, or worthy of them. Such as these find their motives within, not without, and measure their duty by their own endowments, not by those of others. So long as their achievement is proportioned to their powers, they would consider it preposterous to expect praise or blame because it chanced to be great or small. To such natures emulation appears philosophically absurd and despicable in a moral aspect by its substitution of envy for admiration and exultation for regret in one's attitude toward the successes and the failures of others. But all men, even in the last year of the twentieth century, are not of this high order, and the incentives to endeavor requisite for those who are not must be of a sort adapted to their inferior natures. For these, then, emulation of the keenest edge is provided as a constant spur. Those who need this motive will feel it. Those who are above its influence do not need it. I should not fail to mention, resumed the doctor, that for those too deficient in mental or bodily strength to be fairly graded with the main body of workers, we have a separate grade, unconnected with the others, a sort of invalid call, the members of which are provided with a light class of tasks fitted to their strength. All are sick in mind and body, all are deaf and dumb, and lame and blind and crippled, and even are insane, belong to this invalid call, and bear its insignia. The strongest often do nearly a man's work, the feeblest, of course, nothing. But none who can do anything are willing quite to give up. In their lucid intervals, even our insane are eager to do what they can. That is a pretty idea of the invalid call, I said. Even a barbarian from the nineteenth century can appreciate that. It is a very graceful way of disguising charity, and must be grateful to the feelings of its recipients. Charity, repeated Dr. Leed. 
Did you suppose that we considered the incapable class we are talking of objects of charity? Why, naturally, I said, inasmuch as they are incapable of self-support. But here the doctor took me up quickly. Who is capable of self-support? he demanded. There is no such thing in a civilized society as self-support. In a state of society so barbarous as not even to know family cooperation, each individual may possibly support himself, though even then for a part of his life only. But from the moment that men begin to live together, and constitute even the rudest sort of society, self-support becomes impossible. As men grow more civilized, and the subdivision of occupations and services is carried out, a complex mutual dependence becomes a universal rule. Every man, however solitary may seem his occupation, is a member of a vast industrial partnership as large as the nation, as large as humanity. The necessity of mutual dependence should imply the duty and guarantee of mutual support, and that it did not in your day constituted the essential cruelty and unreason of your system. That may all be so, I replied, but it does not touch the case of those who are unable to contribute anything to the product of industry. Surely I told you this morning, at least I thought I did, replied Dr. Leed, that the right of a man to maintenance at the nation's table depends on the fact that he is a man, and not on the amount of health and strength he may have, so long as he does his best. You said so, I answered, but I supposed the rule applied only to the workers of different ability. Does it also hold of those who can do nothing at all? Are they not also men? I am to understand, then, that the lame, the blind, the sick, and the impotent are as well off as the most efficient, and have the same income? Certainly, was the reply. The idea of charity on such a scale, I answered, would have made our most enthusiastic philanthropists gasp. If you had a sick brother at home, replied Dr. Leed, unable to work, would you feed him on less dainty food, and lodge and clothe him more poorly than yourself? More likely far, you would give him the preference, nor would you think of calling it charity. Would not the word in that connection fill you with indignation? Of course, I replied, but the cases are not parallel. There is a sense, no doubt, in which all men are brothers, but this general sort of brotherhood is not to be compared, except for rhetorical purposes, to the brotherhood of blood, either as to its sentiment or its obligations. There speaks the nineteenth century, exclaimed Dr. Leet. Ah, Mr. West, there is no doubt as to the length of time that you slept. If I were to give you, in one sentence, a key to what may seem the mysteries of our civilization as compared with that of your age, I should say that it is the fact that the solidarity of the race and the brotherhood of men, which to you were but fine phrases, are, to our thinking and feeling, ties as real and as vital as physical fraternity. But even setting that consideration aside, I do not see why it so surprises you that those who cannot work are conceded the full right to live on the produce of those who can. Even in your day, the duty of military service for the protection of the nation, to which our industrial service corresponds, while obligatory on those able to discharge it, did not operate to deprive of the privileges of citizenship those who were unable. They stayed at home, and were protected by those who fought, and nobody questioned their right to be, or thought less of them. So, now, the requirement of industrial service from those able to render it does not operate to deprive of the privileges of citizenship, which now implies the citizen's maintenance, him who cannot work. The worker is not a citizen because he works, but works because he is a citizen. As you recognize the duty of the strong to fight for the weak, we, now that fighting is gone by, recognize his duty to work for him. A solution which leaves an unaccounted for residuum is no solution at all, and our solution of the problem of human society would have been none at all had it left the lame, the sick, and the blind outside with the beasts to fare as they might. Better far have left the strong and well unprovided for than these burdened ones, toward whom every heart must yearn, and for whom ease of mind and body should be provided, if for no others. Therefore it is, as I told you this morning, that the title of every man, woman, and child to the means of existence rests on no basis less plain, broad, and simple than the fact that they are fellows of one race, members of one human family. The only coin current is the image of God, 
and that is good for all we have. I think there is no feature of the civilization of your epoch so repugnant to modern ideas as the neglect with which you treated your dependent classes. Even if you had no pity, no feeling of brotherhood, how was it that you did not see that you were robbing the incapable class of their plain right in leaving them unprovided for? I do not quite follow you there, I said. I admit the claim of this class to our pity, but how could they who produced nothing claim a share of the product as a right? How happened it, was Dr. Leeds' reply, that your workers were able to produce more than so many savages would have done? Was it not wholly on account of the heritage of the past knowledge and achievements of the race, the machinery of society, thousands of years in contriving, found by you ready-made to your hand? How did you come to be possessors of this knowledge and this machinery, which represent nine parts to one contributed by yourself in the value of your product? You inherited it, did you not? And were not these others, these unfortunate and crippled brothers whom you cast out, joint inheritors, co-heirs with you? What did you do with their share? Did you not rob them when you put them off with crusts, who were entitled to sit with the heirs, and did you not add insult to robbery when you called the crusts charity? Ah, Mr. West, Dr. Leed continued, as I did not respond, what I do not understand is, setting aside all considerations either of justice or brotherly feeling toward the crippled and defective, how the workers of your day could have had any heart for their work, knowing that their children, or grandchildren, if unfortunate, would be deprived of the comforts and even necessities of life. It is a mystery how men with children could favour a system under which they were rewarded beyond those less endowed with bodily strength or mental power, for, by the same discrimination by which the father profited, the son, for whom he would give his life, being perchance weaker than others, might be reduced to crusts and beggary. How men dared leave children behind them, I have never been able to understand. Note. Although in his talk on the previous evening Dr. Leet had emphasized the pains taken to enable every man to ascertain and follow his natural bent in choosing an occupation, it was not till I learned that the worker's income is the same in all occupations that I realized how absolutely he may be counted on to do so, and thus, by selecting the harness which sets most lightly on himself, find that in which he can pull best. The failure of my age in any systematic or effective way to develop and utilize the natural aptitudes of men for the industries and intellectual avocations was one of the great wastes, as well as one of the most common causes of unhappiness in that time. The vast majority of my contemporaries, though nominally free to do so, never really chose their occupations at all, but were forced by circumstances into work for which they were relatively inefficient, because not naturally fitted for it. The rich, in this respect, had little advantage over the poor. The latter, indeed, being generally deprived of education, had no opportunity even to ascertain the natural aptitudes they might have, and, on account of their poverty, were unable to develop them by cultivation, even when ascertained. The liberal and technical professions, except by favourable accident, were shut to them, to their own great loss and that of the nation. On the other hand, the well-to-do, although they could command education and opportunity, were scarcely less hampered by social prejudice, which forbade them to pursue manual avocations even when adapted to them, and destined them, whether fit or unfit, to the professions, thus wasting many an excellent handicraftsman. Mercenary considerations, tempting men to pursue money-making occupations for which they were unfit, instead of less remunerative employments for which they were fit, were responsible for another vast perversion of talent. All these things now are changed. Equal education and opportunity must needs bring to light whatever aptitudes a man has, and neither social prejudices nor mercenary considerations hamper him in the choice of his life-work. End of chapter 12《and 14 of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, 2000 to 1887, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter 13. As Edith had promised he should do, Dr. Leed accompanied me to my bedroom when I retired, to instruct me as to the adjustment of the musical telephone. 
he showed how, by turning a screw, the volume of the music could be made to fill the room, or die away to an echo as so faint and far that one could scarcely be sure whether he heard or imagined it. If, of two persons side by side, one desired to listen to music and the other to sleep, it could be made audible to one and inaudible to another. "'I should strongly advise you to sleep if you can tonight, Mr. West, in preference to listening to the finest tunes in the world,' the doctor said, after explaining these points. "'In the trying experience you are just now passing through, sleep is a nerve tonic for which there is no substitute.' Mindful of what had happened to me that very morning, I promised to heed his counsel. "'Very well,' he said. "'Then I will set the telephone at eight o'clock.' "'What do you mean?' I asked. He explained that, by a clockwork combination, a person could arrange to be wakened at any hour by the music. It began to appear, as has since fully proved to be the case, that I had left my tendency to insomnia behind me with the other discomforts of existence in the nineteenth century, for though I took no sleeping draught this time, yet, as the night before, I had no sooner touched the pillow than I was asleep. I dreamt that I sat on the throne of the Abenchars in the banqueting hall of the Alhambra, feasting my lords and generals, who next day were to follow the crescent against the Christian dogs of Spain. The air, cooled by the spray of fountains, was heavy with the scent of flowers. A band of nouch girls, round-limbed and luscious-lipped, danced with voluptuous grace to the music of brazen and stringed instruments. Looking up to the latticed galleries, one caught a gleam now and then from the eye of some beauty of the royal harem, looking down upon the assembled flower of Moorish chivalry. Louder and louder clashed the cymbals, wilder and wilder grew the strain, till the blood of the desert race could no longer resist the martial delirium, and the swart nobles leapt to their feet. A thousand scimitars were bared, and the cry, Allah il Allah, shook the hall and awoke me, to find it broad daylight and the room tingling with the electric music of the Turkish reveille. At the breakfast table, when I told my host of my morning's experience, I learned that it was not a mere chance that the piece of music which awakened me was a reveille. The airs played at one of the halls during the waking hours of the morning were always of an inspiring type. By the way, I said, I have not thought to ask you anything about the state of Europe. Have the societies of the old world also been remodelled? Yes, replied Artelite. The great nations of Europe, as well as Australia, Mexico, and parts of South America, are now organized industrially like the United States, which was the pioneer of the evolution. The peaceful relations of these nations are assured by a loose form of federal union of worldwide extent. An international council regulates the mutual intercourse and commerce of the members of the Union, and their joint policy toward the more backward races, which are gradually being educated up to civilized institutions. Complete autonomy within its own limits is enjoyed by every nation. "'How do you carry on commerce without money?' I said. "'In trading with other nations you must use some sort of money, although you dispense with it in the internal affairs of the nation.' Oh, no, money is as superfluous in our foreign as in our internal relations. When foreign commerce was conducted by private enterprise, money was necessary to adjust it on account of the multifarious complexity of the transactions. But nowadays it is a function of the nations as units. There are thus only a dozen or so merchants in the world, and their business being supervised by the International Council, a simple system of book accounts serves perfectly to regulate their dealings. Customs duties of every sort are, of course, superfluous. A nation simply does not import what its government does not think requisite for the general interest. Each nation has a bureau of foreign exchange, which manages its trading. For example, the American bureau, estimating such and such quantities of French goods necessary to America for a given year, sends the order to the French bureau, which in turn sends its order to our bureau. The same is done mutually by all the nations." But how are the prices of foreign goods settled, since there is no competition? The price at which one nation supplies another with goods, replied Dr. Leed, must be that at which it supplies its own citizens. So you see there is no danger of misunderstanding. Of course, no nation is theoretically bound to supply another with a product of its own labor, but it is for the interest of all to exchange some commodities. If a nation is regularly supplying another with certain goods, Notice is required from either side of any important change in the relation. 
But what if a nation, having a monopoly of some natural product, should refuse to supply it to the others, or to one of them? Such a case has never occurred, and could not, without doing the refusing party vastly more harm than the others, replied Dr. Leed. In the first place, no favoritism could be legally shown. The law requires that each nation shall deal with the others, in all respects, on exactly the same footing. Such a cause as you suggest would cut off the nation adopting it from the remaining of the earth for all purposes whatever. The contingency is one that need not give us much anxiety. But, said I, supposing a nation, having a natural monopoly in some product of which it exports more than it consumes, should put the price away up, and thus, without cutting off the supply, make a profit out of its neighbor's necessities. Its own citizens would of course have to pay the higher price on that commodity, but as a body would make more out of foreigners than they would be out of pocket themselves. When you come to know how prices of all commodities are determined nowadays, you will perceive how impossible it is that they could be altered, except with reference to the amount or arduousness of the work required respectively to produce them was Dr. Leeds' reply. This principle is an international as well as a national guarantee, but even without it the sense of community of interest, international as well as national, and the conviction of the folly of selfishness are too deep nowadays to render possible such a piece of sharp practice as you apprehend. You must understand that we all look forward to an eventual unification of the world as one nation. That, no doubt, will be the ultimate form of society, and will realize certain economic advantages over the present federal system of autonomous nations. Meanwhile, however, the present system works so nearly perfectly that we are quite content to leave to posterity the completion of the scheme. There are, indeed, some who hold that it never will be completed, on the ground that the federal plan is not merely a provisional solution of the problem of human society, but the best ultimate solution. "'How do you manage?' I asked when the books of any two nations do not balance. Supposing we import more from France than we export to her. At the end of each year, replied the doctor, the books of every nation are examined. If France is found in our debt, probably we are in the debt of some nation which owes France, and so on with all the nations. The balances that remain after the accounts have been cleared by the International Council should not be large under our system. Whatever they may be, the Council requires them to be settled every few years, and may require their settlement at any time if they are getting too large, for it is not intended that any nation shall run largely in debt to another, lest feelings unfavourable to amity should be engendered. To guard further against this, the International Council inspects the commodities interchanged by the nations, to see that they are of perfect quality. But what are the balances finally settled with, seeing that you have no money? in national staples. A basis of agreement is as to what staples shall be accepted and in what proportions, for settlement of accounts, being a preliminary to trade relations. Emigration is another point I want to ask you about, said I. With every nation organized as a close industrial partnership, monopolizing all means of production in the country, the emigrant, even if he were permitted to land, would starve. I suppose there is no emigration nowadays. On the contrary, there is constant emigration, by which I suppose you mean removal to foreign countries for permanent residence, replied Dr. Leith. It is arranged on a simple international arrangement of indemnities. For example, if a man at twenty-one emigrates from England to America, England loses all the expense of his maintenance and education, and America gets a workman for nothing. America accordingly makes England an allowance. The same principle, varied to suit the case, applies generally. If the man is near the term of his labor when he emigrates, the country receiving him has the allowance. As to imbecile persons, it is deemed best that each nation should be responsible for its own, and the emigration of such must be under full guarantees of support by his own nation. Subject to these regulations, the right of any man to emigrate at any time is unrestricted. But how about mere pleasure trips, tours of observation, how can a stranger travel in a country whose people do not receive money and are themselves supplied with the means of life on a basis not extended to him? His own credit card cannot, of course, be good in other lands. How does he pay his way? An American credit card, replied Dr. Leed, is just as good in Europe as American gold used to be, 
and on precisely the same condition, namely, that it be exchanged into the currency of the country you are travelling in. An American in Berlin takes his credit card to the local office of the International Council, and receives in exchange for the whole or part of it a German credit card, the amount being charged against the United States in favour of Germany on the international account. "'Perhaps Mr. West would like to dine at the Elephant today,' said Edith, as we left the table. "'That is the name we give to the general dining-house in our ward,' explained her father. "'Not only is our cooking done at the public kitchens, as I told you last night, but the service and quality of the meals are much more satisfactory if taken at the dining-house. The two minor meals of the day are usually taken at home, as not worth the trouble of going out, but it is general to go out to dine. We have not done so since you have been with us, from a notion that it would be better to wait till you had become a little more familiar with our ways. What do you think? Shall we take dinner at the dining-house to-day? I said that I should be very much pleased to do so. Not long after, Edith came to me, smiling, and said, "'Last night, as I was thinking what I could do to make you feel at home, until you came to be a little more used to us and our ways, an idea occurred to me. What would you say if I were to introduce you to some very nice people of your own times, whom I am sure you used to be well acquainted with?' I replied rather vaguely that it would certainly be very agreeable, but I did not see how she was going to manage it. "'Come with me,' was our smiling reply." and see if I am not as good as my word. My susceptibility to surprise had been pretty well exhausted by the numerous shocks it had received, but it was with some wonderment that I followed her into a room which I had not before entered. It was a small, cosy apartment, walled with cases filled with books. "'Here are your friends,' said Edith, indicating one of the cases, and as my eye glanced over the names on the backs of the volumes, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, Shelley, Tennyson, Defoe, Dickens, Thackeray, Hugo, Hawthorne, Irving, and a score of other great writers of my time at all time, I understood her meaning. She had indeed made good her promise in a sense compared with which its literal fulfilment would have been a disappointment. She had introduced me to a circle of friends whom the century that had elapsed since last I communed with them had aged as little as it had myself. Their spirit was as high, their wit as keen, their laughter and their tears as contagious, as when their speech had whiled away the hours of a former century. Lonely I was not, and could not be more, with this goodly companionship, however wide the gulf of years that gaped between me and my old life. "'You are glad I brought you here,' exclaimed Edith, radiant, as she read in my face the success of her experiment. "'It was a good idea, was it not, Mr. West? How stupid in me not to think of it before!' I will leave you now with your old friends, for I know there will be no company for you like them just now. But remember, you must not let old friends make you quite forget new ones. And with that smiling caution she left me. Attracted by the most familiar of the names before me, I laid my hand on a volume of Dickens and sat down to read. He had been my prime favourite among the book-writers of the century, I mean the nineteenth century, and a week had rarely passed in my old life during which I had not taken up some volume of his works to while away an idle hour. Any volume with which I had been familiar would have produced an extraordinary impression, read under my present circumstances. But my exceptional familiarity with Dickens, and his consequent power to call up the associations of my former life, gave to his writings an effect no others could have had, to intensify, by force of contrast, my appreciation of the strangeness of my present environment. However new and astonishing one's surroundings, the tendency is to become a part of them so soon that almost from the first the power to see them objectively and fully measure their strangeness is lost. That power, already dulled in my case, the pages of Dickens restored by carrying me back through their associations to the standpoint of my former life. With a clearness which I had not been able before to attain, I saw now the past and present like contrasting pictures side by side. The genius of the great novelist of the nineteenth century, like that of Homer, might indeed defy time, but the setting of his pathetic tales, the misery of the poor, the wrongs of power, the pitiless cruelty of the system of society, had passed away as utterly as Circe and the Sirens, Charybdis and Cyclops. During the hour or two that I sat there with Dickens open before me, I did not actually read more than a couple of pages. Every paragraph, every phrase, brought up some new aspect of the world transformation which had taken place, and led my thoughts on long and widely ramifying excursions. 
As meditating thus in Dr. Leeds' library, I gradually attained a more clear and coherent idea of the prodigious spectacle which I had been so strangely unable to view, I was filled with a deepening wonder at the seeming capriciousness of the fate that had given to one who so little deserved it, or seemed in any way set apart for it, the power alone among his contemporaries to stand upon the earth in this latter day. I had neither foreseen the new world, nor toiled for it, as many about me had done, regardless of the scorn of fools or the misconstruction of the good. Surely it would have been more in accordance with the fitness of things had one of those prophetic and strenuous souls been enabled to see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. He, for example, a thousand times rather than I, who, having beheld in a vision the world I looked on, sang of it in words that again and again during these last wondrous days had rung in my mind. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be, till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man, the federation of the world. Then the common sense of most shall hold a fretful realm in awe, and the kindly earth shall slumber, lapped in universal law. For I doubt not through the ages one increasing purpose runs, and the thoughts of men are widened with the process of the suns. What, though, in his old age, he momentarily lost faith in his own prediction, as prophets in their hours of depression and doubt generally do, the words had remained eternal testimony to the seership of a poet's heart, the insight that is given to faith. I was still in the library when some hours later Dr. Leed sought me there. Edith told me of her idea, he said, and I thought it an excellent one. I had a little curiosity what writer you would first turn to. Ah, Dickens, you admired him then. That is where we moderns agree with you. Judged by our standards, he overtops all the writers of his age, not because his literary genius was highest, but because his great heart beat for the poor, because he made the cause of the victims of society his own, and devoted his pen to exposing its cruelties and shams. No man of his time did so much as he to turn men's minds to the wrong and wretchedness of the old order of things, and open their eyes to the necessity of the great change that was coming, although he himself did not clearly foresee it. Chapter 14 A heavy rainstorm came up during the day, and I had concluded that the condition of the streets would be such that my hosts would have to give up the idea of going out to dinner, although the dining hall I had understood to be quite near. I was much surprised when at the dinner hour the ladies appeared prepared to go out, but without either rubbers or umbrellas. The mystery was explained when we found ourselves on the street, for a continuous waterproof covering had been let down so as to enclose the sidewalk and turn it into a well-lighted and perfectly dry corridor, which was filled with a stream of ladies and gentlemen dressed for dinner. At the corners the entire open space was similarly roofed in. Edith Leet, with whom I walked, seemed much interested in learning what appeared to be entirely new to her, that in the stormy weather the streets of the Boston of my day had been impassable, except to persons protected by umbrellas, boots, and heavy clothing. "'Were sidewalk coverings not used at all?' she asked. "'They were used,' I explained, but in a scattered and utterly unsystematic way, being private enterprises. She said to me that at the present time all the streets were provided against inclement weather in the manner I saw, the apparatus being rolled out of the way when it was unnecessary. She intimated that it would be considered an extraordinary imbecility to permit the weather to have any effect on the social movements of the people. Dr. Leed, who was walking ahead, overhearing something of our talk, turned to say that the difference between the age of individualism and that of concert was well characterized by the fact that, in the nineteenth century, when it rained, the people of Boston put up three hundred thousand umbrellas over as many heads, and in the twentieth century they put up one umbrella over all the heads. As we walked on, Edith said, "'The private umbrella is father's favorite figure to illustrate the old way when everybody lived for himself and his family. There is a nineteenth-century painting at the art gallery representing a crowd of people in the rain, each one holding his umbrella over himself and his wife, and giving his neighbors the drippings, which he claims must have been meant by the artist as a satire on his times.' We now entered a large building into which a stream of people was pouring. I could not see the front, owing to the awning, 
but if in correspondence with the interior, which was even finer than the store I visited the day before, it would have been magnificent. My companion said that the sculptured group over the entrance was especially admired. Going up a grand staircase, we walked some distance along a broad corridor with many doors opening upon it. At one of these, which bore my host's name, we turned in, and I found myself in an elegant dining-room containing a table for four. Windows opened on a courtyard where a fountain played to a great height and music made the air electric. "'You seem at home here,' I said, as we seated ourselves at table, and Dr. Leed touched an annunciator. "'This is, in fact, a part of our house, slightly detached from the rest,' he replied. "'Every family in the ward has a room set apart in this great building for its permanent and exclusive use for a small annual rental. For trenchant guests and individuals there is accommodation on another floor. If we expect to dine here, we put in our orders the night before, selecting anything in market, according to the daily reports in the papers. The meal is as expensive or as simple as we please, though, of course, everything is vastly cheaper as well as better than it would be prepared at home. There is actually nothing which our people take more interest in than the perfection of the catering and cooking done for them, and I admit that we are a little vain of the success that has been attained by this branch of the service. Ah, my dear Mr. West, though other aspects of your civilization were more tragical, I can imagine that none could have been more depressing than the poor dinners you had to eat, that is, all of you who had not great wealth. You would have found none of us disposed to disagree with you on that point, I said. The waiter, a fine-looking young fellow, wearing a slightly distinctive uniform, now made his appearance. I observed him closely, as it was the first time I had been able to study particularly the bearing of one of the enlisted members of the industrial army. This young man, I knew from what I had been told, must be highly educated, and the equal, socially and in all respects, of those he served. But it was perfectly evident that to neither side was the situation in the slightest degree embarrassing. Dr. Leed addressed the young man in a tone devoid, of course, as any gentleman's would be, of superciliousness, but at the same time not in any way deprecatory, while the manner of the young man was simply that of a person intent on discharging correctly the task he was engaged in, equally without familiarity or obsequiousness. It was, in fact, the manner of a soldier on duty, but without the military stiffness. As the youth left the room, I said, I cannot get over my wonder at seeing a young man like that serving so contentedly in a menial position. What is that word menial? I never heard it, said Edith. It is obsolete now, remarked her father. If I understand it rightly, it applied to persons who performed particularly disagreeable and unpleasant tasks for others, and carried with it an implication of contempt. Was it not so, Mr. West? That is about it, I said personal service, such as waiting on tables, was considered menial, and held in such contempt in my day, that persons of culture and refinement would suffer hardship before condescending to it. "'What a strangely artificial idea!' exclaimed Mrs. Leed, wonderingly. "'And yet these services had to be rendered,' said Edith. "'Of course,' I replied. "'But we imposed them on the poor, and those who had no alternative but starvation.' and increase the burden you imposed on them by adding your contempt, remarked Dr. Leed. I don't think I clearly understand, said Edith. Do you mean that you permitted people to do things for you which you despised them for doing, or that you accepted services from them which you would have been unwilling to render them? You can't surely mean that, Mr. West. I was obliged to tell her that the fact was just as she had stated. Dr. Leed, however, came to our relief. To understand why Edith is surprised, he said, you must know that nowadays it is an axiom of ethics that to accept a service from another which we would be unwilling to return in kind, if need were, is like borrowing with the intention of not repaying, while to enforce such a service by taking advantage of the poverty or necessity of a person would be an outrage like forcible robbery. It is the worst thing about any system which divides men, or allows them to be divided, into classes and castes that it weakens the sense of a common humanity. Unequal distribution of wealth, and, still more effectually, unequal opportunities of education and culture, divided society in your day into classes which in many respects regarded each other as distinct races. There is not, after all, such a difference as might appear between our ways of looking at this question of service. 
ladies and gentlemen of the cultured class in your day would no more have permitted persons of their own class to render them services they would scorn to return than we would permit anybody to do so. The poor and the uncultured, however, they looked upon as of another kind from themselves. The equal wealth and equal opportunities of culture which all persons now enjoy have simply made us all members of one class, which corresponds to the most fortunate class with you. Until this equality of condition had come to pass, the idea of the solidarity of humanity, the brotherhood of all men, could never have become the real conviction and practical principle of action it is nowadays. In your day, the same phrases were indeed used, but they were phrases, merely. Do the waiters also volunteer? No, replied Dr. Leet. The waiters are young men in the unclassified grade of the industrial army who are assignable to all sorts of miscellaneous occupations not requiring special skill. Waiting on table is one of these, and every young recruit is given a taste of it. I myself served as a waiter for several months in this very dining-house some forty years ago. Once more you must remember that there is recognized no sort of difference between the dignity of the different sorts of work required by the nation. The individual is never regarded, nor regards himself, as the servant of those he serves, nor is he in any way dependent upon them. It is always the nation which he is serving. No difference is recognized between a waiter's functions and those of any other worker. The fact that his is a personal service is indifferent from our point of view. So is a doctor's. I should as soon expect our waiter today to look down on me because I served him as a doctor, as think of looking down on him because he serves me as a waiter. After dinner my entertainers conducted me about the building, of which the extent, the magnificent architecture, and richness of embellishment astonished me. It seemed that it was not merely a dining-hall, but likewise a great pleasure-house and social rendezvous of the quarter, and no appliance of entertainment or recreation seemed lacking. "'You find illustrated here,' said Dr. Leet, when I had expressed my admiration, "'what I said to you in our first conversation, when you were looking out over the city, as to the splendour of our public and common life as compared with the simplicity of our private and home life, and the contrast which, in this respect, the twentieth bears to the nineteenth century. To save ourselves useless burdens, we have as little gear about us at home as is consistent with comfort, but the social side of our life is ornate and luxurious beyond anything the world ever knew before. All the industrial and professional guilds have club-houses as extensive as this, as well as country, mountain, and seaside houses for sport and rest in vacations. Note. In the latter part of the nineteenth century it became a practice of needy young men at some of the colleges of the country to earn a little money for their term bills by serving as waiters on tables at hotels during the long summer vacation. It was claimed, in reply to critics who expressed the prejudices of the time in asserting that persons voluntarily following such an occupation could not be gentlemen, that they were entitled to praise for vindicating by their example the dignity of all honest and necessary labour. The use of this argument illustrates a common confusion in thought on the part of my former contemporaries. The business of waiting on tables was in no more need of defence than most of the other ways of getting a living in that day, but to talk of dignity attaching to labour of any sort under the system then prevailing was absurd. There is no way in which selling labour for the highest price it will fetch is more dignified than selling goods for what can be got. Both were commercial transactions to be judged by the commercial standard. By setting a price in money on his service, the worker accepted the money measure for it, and renounced all clear claim to be judged by any other. The sordid taint which this necessity imparted to the noblest and the highest sorts of service was bitterly resented by generous souls, but there was no evading it. There was no exemption, however transcendent the quality of one's service, from the necessity of haggling for its price in the market-place. The physician must sell his healing, and the apostle his preaching, like the rest. The prophet, who had guessed the meaning of God, must dicker for the price of the revelation, and the poet hawk his visions in printer's row. If I were asked to name the most distinguishing felicity of this age, as compared to that in which I first saw the light, I should say that to me it seems to consist in the dignity you have given to labour by refusing to set a price upon it, and abolishing the marketplace for ever. By requiring of every man his best, 
you have made God his taskmaster, and by making honour the sole reward of achievement, you have imparted to all service the distinction peculiar in my day to the soldiers. End of chapter 14